semester, so uh, it's always good to be back on a snowy day. I'm glad you all made the trip. Um, next week on Wednesday, uh, we're going to have uh, another one. Um, uh, an anthropologist in France uh, who will be speaking about landscape and how to it. So, uh, if anyone's interested in coming back to that, let me know. Um, uh, today, um, we're going to hear uh, a short, uh, about 20 minutes uh, talk uh, titled The Singularity and the Problem of Judgment um, by uh, Lauren Ephraim, who's, uh, as many of you know, been here all year uh, as, a, as a postdoctoral fellow at the Khan Arendt Center, also teaching first year seminar. Um, Laura comes to us from Northwestern, where she did her PhD. Uh, her dissertation was Recovering the Common Root of Science and Politics which uh, shares a lot of the same interests I have, so it's been fun to have her here for this semester. Um, as I think we'll hear, a lot of this comes out as somewhat of a response to the conference we had in, in the fall, uh, which we've been talking a lot about uh, this year at the Allen Center. So uh, without uh, any more, I'm going to let Laura uh, talk to us for about 20 minutes, and then it's just a free discussion around the table. So, Laura. Thanks so much. And Thank you to everyone for coming out on such a like snowy, difficult day. It's really great to see some people here. I have a handout, actually, kind of scrap uh, that has just a couple of images from Chris Weil's book, The Singularity is Near, and then on the back some quotations that are part of my presentation, just in case that's helpful as you're listening. Um, uh, yeah, the presentation is is definitely a response to both the conference and to this book, which I only encountered as a result of being here at Bar and participating in the RN seminar uh, last semester and starting to kind of um, yeah take on this new new topic of um, the, the vision of a, a future singularity between man and machines from the perspective that I've been developing through my my graduate work on. Um, political theory, especially the political theory of Hannah Arendt, and um, the history of science. Um, so I'll go ahead and jump on in. Um, computers already vastly exceed the capacity of their makers in very <coughs> impressive ways. In his book, The Singularity is Near, Ray Kurzweil predicts that computers will soon develop to the point that they can remake us in their image. With smaller and faster chips, incorporated into our brains and our bodies, humans will overcome their biology, he says, and become their technology. As you can see in the, um, the graph that's on the top of one side of the handout, Kurzweil thinks that the age of brains is behind us. Humanity will survive into the future only by merging with machines. Inventions <coughs> are worthy of critique. Um, I'm not the computer scientist who can really take them apart um, from that point of view. Um, instead, as a political theorist, my primary response to Kurzweil's epochal graph is frustration that its chosen scope excludes consideration of political phenomena altogether. Not even the fall of Rome merits a slight jog downwards in Kurzweil's upward trajectory. So for those of us who are inclined to pay attention to the sliver of this graph that represents the time of politics, it's easy to imagine unexpected zigs and zags breaking up that smooth curve. So to remind you of Arendt's reminder to an age that's preoccupied with prediction, and this is a quote that's <coughs> hand out there to quote, history in contradistinction to nature is full of events. Here, the miracle of accident and infinite improbability occurs so frequently that it seems strange to speak of miracles at all. But the reason for this frequency is merely that historical processes are created and constantly interrupted by human initiative, by the initium man is, insofar as he is an acting being. Hence, it is not in the least superstitious, it's even a counsel of realism, to look for the unforeseen and unpredictable to be prepared for and to expect miracles in the political realm. So I can't prove that Kurzweil is wrong when he says that the singularity is inevitable and imminent, but following Arendt's counsel of realism, I nonetheless expect that the unpredictable will interrupt Kurzweil's projections, given that we now occupy that slender portion of the curve where human initiative matters. I'm not personally worried about the supposed nearness of the singularity. 
Kurzweil would likely say that my blasé attitude is itself totally predictable. It's very normal for we pre-augmented humans to adopt what he calls the intuitive linear view of change. We overlook the upward spike that looms just past the elbow of an exponential growth curve. And that graph is composed of several exponential growth curves glued together. As I read him, Kurzweil takes on the task of writing the singularities near in order to shake us out of the stupor of our linear intuitions. He tells the story of the coming singularity to incite us to judge our entanglements with technology anew. And I think he's right to do so. For whether or not the singularity is near, human computer hybridity is already here, and new technologies for augmenting human biology are coming. So rather than interrogating the correctness of Kurzweil's story of the human <coughs> singularity, I want to examine the kind of judgment that he's calling for in telling this story. I think that there is something to worry about when it comes to Kurzweil's preferred mode of judgment. Adopting this mode of judgment would undermine our ability to evaluate the present state of technology, for it represents an assault on the faculty of common sense, a faculty that I, following Arendt, view as the source of our sense of reality and a necessary condition for political judgment. So to begin at the beginning of Kurzweil's book, in his autobiographical prologue, Kurzweil describes his lifelong appreciation of the human mental faculties. His awe at human ideas is what drove him to become an inventor, after all. Quote, to this day, I remain convinced of this basic philosophy. No matter what quandaries we face, there is an idea that can enable us to prevail. Furthermore, we can find that idea, and when we find it, we need to implement it. My life has been shaped by this imperative, the power of an idea. This is itself an idea. But Kurzweil is most in awe at the human mind's capacity for self-overcoming. Quote, the story I wish to tell in this book is predicated on the idea that we have the ability to understand our own intelligence, to access our own source code, if you will, and then revise and expand it. End quote. Human inventions stand to augment the very mental powers that humans use to invent. Kurzweil's story of human self-augmentation is predicated upon human abilities. But as this story unfolds, it characterizes human beings as deeply disabled in comparison with the hybrid beings to come. Quote, Although impressive in many respects, the brain suffers from severe limitations. We use its massive parallelism, 100 trillion interneuronal connections operating simultaneously, to quickly recognize subtle patterns, but our thinking is extremely slow. The basic neural transactions are several million times slower than contemporary electronic circuits. That makes our physiological bandwidth for processing new information extremely limited compared to the exponential growth of the overall human knowledge base. Our version 1.0 biological bodies are likewise frail and subject to a myriad of failure modes, not to mention the cumbersome maintenance rituals they require. While human intelligence is sometimes capable of soaring in its creativity and expressiveness, much human thought is derivative, petty, and circumscribed. The singularity will allow us to transcend these limitations of our biological bodies and brains." End quote. Kurzweil is right. As I sat writing this presentation, my back ached, and I struggled to find the right words to characterize his vision of what it means to be human. I scanned my physiological bandwidth for an appropriate comparison, but my numerous failure modes slow down my limited endowment of neural connections. I turn for help to an archaic brain augmentation technology. The bound copy of Hannah Arendt's. <laughs> there, Arendt offers a critical genealogy of modern science that transposes itself so easily to Kurzweil that his very existence seems to confirm everything that she said about science's origins. Such a transposition can help us to interrogate the stakes of the desolation about non-augmented human capacities that clouds Kurzweil's sunny optimism about technological transcendence. Arendt's story begins with Galileo's glance through the telescope, which she considers to be one of those unprecedented, interruptive events that we touched on earlier. Arendt argues that Galileo's unique accomplishment was to give reality to the heliocentric universe. Reality that the idea of a moving Earth lacked as long as it remained just an idea. 
but what Galileo and his telescope gave with one hand, they took away with the other. The triumph of the augmented human senses in securing the realness of the moving earth defeated the realness of the world disclosed to the unaided senses. What Arendt writes about Galileo's turn to vision-enhancing lenses could just as easily have been written about Kurzweil's turn to brain-augmenting machines. Quote, the point in our context is that both despair and triumph are inherent in the same event. If we wish to put this into historical perspective, it is as if Galileo's discovery proved in demonstrable fact that both the worst fear and the most presumptuous hope of human speculation, the ancient fear that our senses, our very organs for the reception of reality, might betray us, and the Archimedean wish for a point outside the earth from which to unhinge the world could only come true together, as though the wish would be granted only provided that we lost reality, and the fear was to be consummated only if compensated by the acquisition of supermundane powers." End quote. When Galileo achieved the kind of self-overcoming that Kurzweil eagerly anticipates, he unhinged reality. The modern age begins for Arendt when new supermundane powers were unleashed against the most basic tenet of common sense, that the sun rises in the morning and descends in the evening. Common sense is a fundamental sense for Arendt. Without it, we'd have no way to know that our five subjective senses fit us into a reality at all. So when Galileo forced common sense <coughs> to bend its knee before augmented sense, he opened the way to the radical doubt of one René Descartes. As Arendt reads Descartes, he couldn't bear the sense of unreality fostered by scientific instruments, so he turned within, devoting himself to augmenting his mind's computational capacities to compensate for the loss of reality inflicted by sense augmentating technologies like the telescope. Layering augmentation upon augmentation, Cartesian solipsism represents to Arendt a further retreat from common sense, and thus a retreat from the sense of realness that only common sense can supply. In my own view, Kurzweil's story about singularity and his deprecation of the unaided human faculties actually exemplifies this retreat from common sense far better than either Galileo or Descartes. Arendt tends to obscure something that sets these early advocates of augmentation apart from Kurzweil. Galileo, and especially Descartes, appealed to common sense as the source of realness for a new world picture disclosed by their augmented standpoints. Far more than Arendt acknowledged, Descartes and Galileo invoked common sense as an enabling condition for judging phenomena that are too new to yet be real. That's why, in my view, in The Starry Messenger, Galileo constantly compares telescopic observations of the surface of the moon to phenomena that everyone has seen on the Earth's surface. He recognizes that his instrument's lack of availability stands in the way of his capacity to contribute to a shared picture of reality. To compensate, he writes, draws, and publishes, deploying the aug augmentation technology of books to bring the moon down to Earth. Far from abandoning common sense, Galileo depends upon it to fit his uncommon observations into the shared world of appearances, the only place where their reality can be secured. Descartes also used the technology of writing to create a public spectacle of a phenomenon that would otherwise be too private to appear namely the phenomenon of thinking. Descartes thinks that the cogito ergo sum is true beyond a doubt, but it's not enough for him to know the cogito's truth. To make the cogito more real, he tells a story about it to a reading public assembled explicitly in the text for their capacity to judge. He writes the discourse on method in French, he says, because men of good sense are the only judges he hopes to have. Although Arendt failed to see it, Descartes and Galileo can actually exemplify her view of common sense as the faculty that fits us into reality and serves as a condition of possibility for judging new and unprecedented phenomena. As Arendt explains in her writings on political judgment, common sense is what allows a judge to imagine occupying the standpoints of other people, such that her judgment will reflect more than just her own subjective perspective. By imagining that I am, or actually I am not, virtually occupying others' shoes, I can attain what Arendt calls an enlarged mentality. An enlarged mentality is in a manner of speaking an augmentation of one's individual subjective faculties, but Arendt would rightly resist speaking in such terms. 
Her account of political judgment reminds us that man is irreducible to individual subjective faculties. Because we are political beings, because men and not man inhabits the earth, our capacities exceed what any investigation of man's individual powers could possibly convey. Seen as exemplars of an Arendtian view of common sense, Galileo and Descartes remind us of the importance of political faculties in the rise of modern science. The modern scientific tradition, on this reading, did not begin with the triumph of technological and methodological augmentations and the defeat or abandonment of common sense. It began with appeals to common sense on behalf of new augmented ways of seeing and thinking. By reading Arendt against Arendt in this way, I would like to suggest that Kurzweil's deprecating account of the faculties of man represents a departure from the tradition inaugurated by Galileo and Descartes. For instead of appealing to his readers to judge politically, Kurzweil appeals to us to recognize our incapacity to judge that which will take our place. Quote, from our currently limited framework, this imminent event, the singularity, appears to be an acute and abrupt break in the continuity of progress. I emphasize the word currently because one of the salient implications of the singularity will be a change in the nature of our ability to understand. We will become vastly smarter as we merge with our technology." End quote. For Kurzweil, we're just too slow to comprehend the humanity of radically smarter entities. For him, the intuition that the beginning of the singularity is the end of humanity is not just a misunderstanding, it's a symptom of our limited in intelligence in comparison with the coming hybrid beings. Kurzweil is attributing something more than 2020 hindsight to these future beings. He thinks that version 2.0, augmented beings, will be uniquely qualified to judge what it means to be human, for they will have transcended the limited framework in which we are currently trapped. The criterion for judging the coming singularity that Kurzweil proposes in this passage is not the Arendtian enlarged mentality, but expanded intelligence. And it's important to be clear about the difference. Enlarged thinking is perspectival thinking. As I imaginatively travel to visit other vantage points, I don't overcome my own perspective. I use my perspective to enrich itself. The judgment that enlarged thinking makes possible is not merely subjective, but nor is it the objective view from nowhere. Instead, through the alchemy of the imagination and plurality, the situated, perspectival quality of being human becomes an advantage for critical thinking, including the critical interrogation of the category of the human as we encounter new or unfamiliar beings. In contrast, Kurzweil's criterion of expanded intelligence presupposes that judgment is a form of information processing, and perspective is a symptom of humanity's failures as information processors. Of course, humans can seem like brainiacs compared to other biological species. That's why he thinks humans played a special role in the transition between the age of brains and the age of technology. Our brains were bigger and better. But when Kurzweil affirms the human brain for its past successes, just as when he projects its coming obsolescence, he reduces human being to our biological endowment of neural pathways. Kurzweil takes the measure of man by measuring the contents of his skull. In that way, he ignores our nature as political beings entirely, and in so doing, obscures our capacity for enlarged thinking and devalues political judgment. And yet, the singularity is near does call for judgment, and Kurzweil clearly wants us to understand as best as we're able what's about to happen to us. I think that's why he came to talk at Bard, and that's why he dallies in the primitive brain augmentation technology of writing public-facing books. Kurzweil may not recognize the role of plurality in, enlarged, in enlarging human thinking, but he does think that version 1.0 humans need to exercise our imagination and see both the past and the future anew. He encourages us to enlarge our thinking, not by thinking in the place of our peers, but by thinking in the place of the beings we will become once we are augmented. In a series of dialogues interspersed through the text, Kurzweil creates a fictional exemplar of this version 2.0 enlarged mentality, named Molly 2004. Molly 2004 is sassy, materialistic, and a touch self-centered. She's kind of like Sex and the City's Carrie Bradshaw, I think. She converses with several post-biology humans from the future, including her future self, 
plus a smattering of historical figures and Ray, who represents Kurzweil's perspective. Kurzweil seems to be emulating other texts in the history of science in which ordinary lay people are portrayed in a dialogue with representatives of old and new sciences. Galileo's dialogue concerning the two chief world systems is one example. Descartes also wrote a lesser known dialogue in which Polyander, the everyman, serves as the judge in a dispute between a scholastic and a Cartesian. It might seem like a minor victory for feminism that the everyman in 2004 is an every woman, but Kurzweil uses Molly 2004 to feminize the public for which she stands in troubling ways. This every woman is never called upon to decide for herself what the singularity means. She never plays the role of judge in a debate between old and new as Descartes' every man did. Instead, she's cast as the losing side in a somewhat catty rivalry with her own future self. I've given you an example that I think is probably the most catty and troubling example um, of Molly talking to her future self. And we're probably too short on time to bother reading through it. It's not such a pinnacle of, of uh, science writing in the way that, that um, Galileo and Descartes' dialogues are, but, um, but it's a little taste if you want to, to look through it. Um, when Molly 2004 gets into spats with Molly 2104, her future self, she's bound to lose, since the very existence of Molly 2104 goes to show that Molly 2004 will embrace augmentation and will like it. Molly 2004's relations with the male characters in the dialogues are less strained. She lets herself be teased, flirted with, and placated by Ray, and especially by George 2048, a post-singularity male character. Which, by the way, it's interesting that we even still have gender after the singularity. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, when Molly uh, 2104 lets it slip that George 2048 was her first virtual lover, which happens at the end of this dialogue, we learn that Molly 2004 will be seduced by the singularity for its promise of sexual gratification. The gender politics of these often cringeworthy dialogues serve to underscore Kurzweil's view of his public as incapable of really understanding his predictions or acting to change them. He seems to think that the exercise of imaginatively occupying the perspective of post-singularity beings will help us to project our existing desires forward and imagine their fulfillment. Kurzweil's feminized public, like Carrie Bradshaw, might make a fuss about her desire to depend upon her own faculties and be respected for it, but what she really wants is to be taken care of by a Mr. Big. The post-biological characters in the dialogues help to confirm that Molly 2004's protestations notwithstanding, she will be seduced by and learn to love the singularity. These dialogues both pander and condescend. They interrupt Kurzweil's more te technical discussions in a way that implies that many readers won't be able to understand them. These dialogues do not appeal to political judgment. They reveal their author's ambition to placate a public that he views as largely irrelevant to his project, <coughs> except perhaps as an irritating pest. But the thought experiment of imagining one's future augmented self serves to undermine one's self-image as an, as an initium, an acting beginning being. If Molly 2104 is who I, will, who I will become, then it doesn't really matter what I think about new technologies today. If we accept Molly as a model for our judgment, then we will simply judge that our faculties aren't up to the task of judging the coming augmentation of those faculties. Kurzweil's version of enlarged thinking underscores the smallness of human thinking and the impotence of action. Yet, as I hope the examples of Galileo and Descartes helped to show, such augmentation projects can turn us towards common sense. Galileo and Descartes, like Arendt, appeal to common sense as the source of our sense of reality and as the necessary condition for judging new phenomena, especially those phenomena that claim to augment human faculties as we think about the problem of how to judge the new hybridities between man and machine that are upon us now and are coming in the near future, I suggest that we look back to Galileo and Descartes, and of course Arendt, before looking forwards to Kurzweil's imagined singularity. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So, um, we have, yeah, thank you, uh, we have about 20, 25 minutes for questions. Sorry, that's not so long. No, it's good. Uh, Karen, you want to start? 
Oh, I thought it was really interesting what you were getting at. I still want to hear more a bit, I mean, this may be, I'm not an expert in our end, maybe one else who cares, but I'd like to hear more just about common sense. And is common sense opposed to reason? I mean, a pure, I mean, how, how, you, you identify it with multiplicity of perspectives, but I'm, I'm just wondering if you can, I'm not sure if I always, you know, I mean, Bellarmine was appealed to common sense as well, you know, so I'm just kind of wondering if you could explain a bit more kind of what yeah. you mean by that. Well, I, I think it's, it's definitely a more um, complicated idea for Arendt than um, my presentation fully acknowledged. Um, she, I, I think that she sometimes uses it in line with the tradition that thinks about common sense as a sort of um, sense that collates the other five senses, that in order to have your you know, sight and touch and hearing fit together, you need mm -hmm. to have a common sense. But she also talks about it in this much more political fashion, especially in the beginning of the, the life of the mind and the, the lectures on um, judgment, where it's more like it's the sense that we have because we are a species that sort of lives in the plural. Um, but because we have this ability to sort of um, think from the perspective of the other, mm -hmm. we're able to have um, a world that is real, uh, that, that we share together. But despite the fact that for her, the world is a world of appearances. It's not, mm -hmm. um, it's not a, a, a world that has some kind of like uh, metaphysical reality that she's yearning to get to. Um, but it's a world of appearances that can be real because we experience it together and can talk about it. And then in the lectures on judgment, mm -hmm. Without, she, I don't, to my mind, she never really makes the link explicit between the discussion of the sense of the, life of the mind and the way she talks about it in the, the lectures on judgment, but she seems to kind of lean on it as, the, as, as sort of like, well, we have this sense sort of for other people or of the world as seen through other people that lets us um, go visiting in our imagination. Mm -hmm. And no, it's not... Um, a kind of enlargement of the mentality that, that occurs um, by virtue of or with the help of. Kind of <coughs> it's not uh, empathy exactly. It's not like you're trying to really get inside someone else's head. It's more like you're trying to get into their shoes and think in your own head about what it would look like to stand over there. Um, and that for her is, is essential for our ability to judge politically, to come up with opinions about the world that are not sort of mere opinions. They're not, they're not just sort of trapped in our own individual vantage point. But they are still situated. It's still me that's doing the, judge, the judging, and it's, I'm not trying to kind of transcend my situation altogether. So this is a way that she has of sort of eking out a, 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 a form of validity that um, is not objective validity. Mm -hmm. it's, it's subjective and yet it is valid because there's this, there's this political exercise in thinking that takes my vantage and, and travels with it. Interesting. So it sounds almost like the imagination of what you described there. Right? I was going to ask you first when you started speaking, is, is common sense, does it lead you to the truth? But then I think you answered that while you were speaking, that it's not a level of kind of truth versus untruth, it's a level of a kind of, of, in some ways, fictions or political reality, which is, wouldn't it be... But I'm wondering how common sense therefore relates to something that would be true or untrue. Uh, you know, like, like you know, either you know the sun goes around the earth or vice versa. You know, right. And it's common sense going to help us? Something about right. political sensibility is that going to help us understand what happens in such a? Yes. Well, I mean, like I like I was just saying, I think Arendt wants to carve out a kind of validity that's that's fundamentally different from objective validity when she's talking mm -hmm. about judgment. And you're right, the imagination is crucial for this mm -hmm. for this exercise in in, in traveling. It's sort of the imagination plus common sense, in a way, gives you the possibility of this, this political judgment. But um, I think she, she wants to keep them, them distinct. There is, there is objective judgment, and that's what um, <coughs> philosophers are trying to do, and that's perhaps what scientists are trying to do. Um, and political judgment is different. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's not going to get you objectivity. There is, she says um, something along the lines of there, there is a truth, but not the mm -hmm. truth that you're going for when you, when you judge in this way. In my own work, I try to push on that boundary that Arendt would want to erect between um, 
subjectively valid political judgments and objectively valid scientific judgments. Um, so this is part of where I get into quarrels with her about her reading of someone like Descartes or Galileo, where she will tend to talk about them as sort of actually transcending their perspective, actually attaining an Archimedean standpoint mm -hmm. so, that they, so, so that she can give them objective validity, right? It's, that's not hers, that's theirs. And she can, can track its dangers, the dangers of, of objective validity. But um, I try to, to look at ways in which we can see traces of the dependence of someone like Descartes upon something like Arendtian political judgment as he tries to give us a new world picture, that you sort of need to have a sense of the reality of your world before you can try and talk about its truth. So there's, t to my mind, a sort of priority that we can accord to political judgment over objective judgment, and in that way kind of think their relationship. But isn't, I'm sorry to start with a thought and interrupt Thomas, but it's a leading question too, but isn't, um, that's the worst part of it, um, the similarity between Descartes and Galileo as against them, rather that they have come to recognize, as they see it, that what used to be considered common sense is a local form of knowledge that doesn't apply to a, a more global scale. That you use the word um, mm -hmm. the judgment being situated. Mm -hmm. a, a political judgment depends on a, a sort of perspectivization that allows you to be situated in another person's shoes, if not in their brain. Mm -hmm. um, but from both Galileo's and Descartes' point of view, and now there is no, as you say, there isn't a the situation, there are just a situations. Mm -hmm. So you think, you're, you're suspecting that Arendt has sort of a more universalistic view of common sense than they do? Is that I think that she does, asking? and I'm, I'm hoping to have mm -hmm. my sense of that corrected. Or Well, I, I mean, uh, I think that her, her understanding of common sense is, is shifts so much that it's hard, it's hard to really, for me to really come down and, and agree, you know, either agree with you or disagree with her that, mm -hmm. that it's universalistic, because she does sometimes talk about it as like, a faculty that's just sort of inherent in the same way that like we all have the sense of sight unless we're blind, we all have the sense of common sense unless we're Descartes. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, especially when she's talking about judgment, I read her as wanting to say like look you judge from where you are and so like right now we're going to be thinking in terms of the other perspectives around this table, and it's not, it's not like that will make it a bad judgment because we don't expand further to include the people who are in the dining hall and who are beyond Bard and who are in other nations and things like that. I mean, it has, it is a situated judgment, but it's one that uses your situation to kind of um, work your way out of the narrowness of, of sort of mere belief or just more mere taste or something like that. Could it be then that Arendt and Kurzweil are in a sort of agreement that he also is thinking that at some point soon um, it, it, we won't be making a judgment on it. He also thinks it's not going to be an narrowness mm -hmm. because we won't be placed in the way that we previously have been. That the I mean, yeah, I, th the that's, I, I think you're right. I think he, he thinks that we will be placeless in the near future. At the end of this portion of the dialogue, he talks about his view of love, being in love, which is being able to actually you know, sort of merge with the other, to fully occupy them and, and their perspective. I, I don't think that that's what Arendt is after. Yeah. Um, I, you know, she's always talking, I mean, even Kurzweil's view of love is not her view of love. Even her view of love, she thinks it's sort of too close, that you need a little more distance than that. Um, when you're relating to other people politically. Um, I'm losing track of your question a little bit, but... Um, Just trying to think if the two of them have something in common in terms of um, how they have processed, how physics has changed our understanding of um, spatial geometry mm -hmm. and our relationship to space and whether we are, whether our knowledge is situated mm -hmm. or soon will not be. I mean, I think Arendt fears very much that, our, that we would cease to be situated beings. And I think Kurzweil, you know, can't wait yeah. for that to happen. So in that sense, I, I'm not exactly grasping the um, why is she commonality here. What? Why is she afraid? What's the fear? That's the thing that I, I'm glad to be in the Arendt Center because mm -hmm. I, I've read it and I've taught it and I don't, I don't, under, I don't share it. Mm -hmm. and I, don't, I don't feel like I'm Kurzweil. Mm -hmm. I don't get what the, what the fear is. I mean, 
Okay, so I think I understand you a little bit better now. I, in that sense, I, I agree with you to some extent. Like I, I, I would want to put a little bit of distance between myself and Arendt on that on that point. That, and I think that's what I was trying to do a bit with the discussion of Descartes and Galileo. That Arendt, you know, the telescope is already scary for her in a sense. Like it's already an augmentation of human powers that sort of um, vanquishes perspective, makes makes human perspective the un, sort of unaided faculties of man seem like they're mere, seem like they, they are paltry and that they're, that they're not worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So it's the supplanting of what is situated and perspectival by something that seems to be better that I think causes fear for her because she thinks that being able to have a perspective is what makes us human, it's what allows us to judge, it's certainly you know, part of what um, gives us politics. Um, Kurzweil doesn't really have those concerns, and I'm trying to kind of argue that um, this is because he doesn't really take into account the, the political nature of man, so that someone who could so radically overcome their own vantage that they could merge with or even be another, kind, another person, mm -hmm. to him seems like the fruition of human faculties, not as the kind of end of humanity, you know, where, where humans are sort of inherently perspectival. And again, I don't really think that's going to happen, so I'm not, I'm not nearly as worried about it. I mean, I think that, you know, we still have a perspective even though we have telescopes. <coughs> um, we still have a, 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 an ability to judge, even though we use computers to interface with each other. Um, so I, I think that, that that in a sense, it's like judgment is a more adaptable faculty than Arendt sometimes seems to think. Um, but I th so that's why it's not the prospect of singularity that I think is worrisome from my Arendtian vantage. It's it's this kind of call to judge what's coming in a particular way that I think is is a problem. That it's a sort of narrowing of your own perspective in the service of letting something unfold that will allow perspective to be so totally overcome that we just won't need to worry about it anymore. But maybe sure, Thomas jump in. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm going in a slightly different direction, so if someone's right on this, yeah. Olivia? No, well, I would just push more on this common sense. And... Yeah, please, go ahead. I mean, maybe in a, a, a just to encourage you to say more, um, but also because I'm a bit worried that we that, that we might need to talk more about what kind of common is mm -hmm. involved in the common sense. Um, and the, the one example of common sense being that the sun comes up and goes down mm -hmm. seems to me is not going to give us the common that Parent is, is talking about. Mm -hmm. But as a way of sort of pushing you, I, I, it's just a way of um, maybe being a little bit provocative to get you to expand on what it is that Arendt gives us mm -hmm. that Kurzweil doesn't. And you made the distinction between um, expanded intelligence and enlarged thinking. Right? Mm -hmm. This is yay for Arendt because she's not limiting uh, things to expanded intelligence where it would be more information would, would overcome our, um, our limits. But in a way, when I was listening to you, I was thinking, well, couldn't one describe have you gone all the way in fleshing out what this enlarged thinking is, such that it's different from um, expanded intelligence? Because in a way, just being in someone else's shoes, that might be just more information. I mean, how is it, how is it really different mm -hmm. to... Well, why is that not just more information? Oh, okay, now I get that other perspective that I add on to my perspective. Mm -hmm. what, do, do you see what I mean? That one could, I mean, I know that I, I, I sense your... Your, um, and, and I'm sure you're right. There is a difference between enlarged thinking and um, and a vision of enhancement, which would be accumulation of information. But mm -hmm. I would push you on convincing the skeptic who would just say, "Well, great, I get to see things from lots of different people's shoes. I yeah. got more information." Yeah, no, I, I can actually that's tack on my question right to the end of that, which is the um, about that the difference, which I think is, is very interesting. If you try and think about what Kurzweil's response would be, he'd want to, exp I think, would want to say anything that you put in the box of enhanced thinking or expanded thinking can be explained by expanded intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so that, why is that not true?
Yes, those are very, very helpful questions. Um, and I certainly will, as I keep working with, with this, um, try to become more specific about, you know, yeah, why, like, why is it not just more information that you get when you think yourself into the, the other's perspective? I mean, I think my, my provisional attempt to, to go further would be to say that it's not just more information because, you know, just like being in my own shoes is not a function of information, being in someone else's shoes is not going to be a function of information. Like, as though who you were was reducible to the, the information in your, in your brain or sort of um, and that is the way that, that Kurzweil tends to think about human beings. Um, so, yeah, you need a, a fuller, richer account of what sort of human experience.